Step 3. Hongu Mandel effect. This is a very interesting effect in quantum optics and has no classical counterpart, and it's used in many quantum technologies. And it's the following scenario. We have our beam splitter, and this time we have two input photons. One photon in mode 1 and the other photon in mode 2. And we ask again the same question. What are the photodetection signals at D3 and D4? We assume that the photons arrive at the beam splitter at the same time. And also to make calculation a little bit easier, we assume that the beam splitter is a lossless 50-50 beam splitter described by the following matrix. So looking at the scenario, intuitively we can immediately say that there are four possible outcomes. One outcome is that both photons from the input modes get reflected or both of them get transmitted. The other two outcomes were one of the photons gets reflected and the other one is transmitted, so they both go to the same detector. And the final outcome is the following, that the other photon gets reflected and the other photon gets transmitted, going to detector T3. From these outcomes, we can see that the first two, where both of them are reflected or both of them are transmitted, are indistinguishable. When both of the detectors click, we cannot really know whether they were both reflected or both transmitted. So to analyze this scenario, let's start by computing the probability of a double detection. We know how to do that. We have to compute the W2 at R3 and R4 and time t. We are looking for coincidence clicks. So what we need to do is we have to compute the modulus squared of E3 times E4 applied to the input state uh, where uh, input of mode 1 is a single photon and input of mode 2 is also a single photon. So after substitution for our E3 and E4, we get the following expression. Here this 4 in the denominator comes from the fact that we are looking at a 50-50 beam splitter. And then we've got the usual S squared times uh, one photon amplitude to the power of 4 because we've got two fields, E3 and E4, and the important bit over here. So let's expand this expression for the A1 and A2. And what we get is the following. We see immediately that applying the annihilation operated on mode 1 twice will destroy the one photon state and subsequently also the vacuum. So that gives us 0. Similarly, when we apply the annihilation operator for mode 2, that will give us 0. So those terms disappear. How about these two terms in the middle? Well, we don't even have to think about what happens uh, and how they act on the inputs because A2 commutes with A1. So these two terms are the same, but they have opposite signs. So they cancel as well. In other words, W2, our photodetection signal for a coincidence event, is zero. This is quite surprising. We don't get any coincidences, even though we started with two photons. In the previous step, we only had a single photon and we calculated that there was no probability for a coincidence. That made sense. But in this scenario, we've got two photons, and both of them can be reflected and transmitted. And yet, somehow, we don't get any coincidence counts. So in order to understand that, we have to look at what's going on at the output, output state. We can do that quite easily by rewriting the input state in the following form. So our input is a single photon in mode 1 and a single photon in mode 2. And we can write it in terms of the vacuum. So we've got the creation operator A1 dagger acting on mode 1 and the creation operator A2 dagger creating a, a photon in mode 2. And also we can transform our output fields A3 and A4 in terms of A1 and A2. Or when we reverse it, we can write the input fields in terms of the output fields as follows over here. So our input state one photon in mode 1 and one photon in mode 2 is transformed into the following state after the application of the beam splitter. So here we're just substituting for A1 and A2, but we are not acting on the input state vacuum in mode 1 and vacuum in mode 2. We are acting on vacuum in mode 3 and vacuum in mode 4 because initially those modes are also in vacuum. There are no photons present. The photons get created by these operators here. So again, let's expand and we get the following expression. And we see that here in the middle, this A3 dagger, A4 dagger commutes also with A4 dagger, A3 dagger. So these two terms will cancel. 
all we are left with is a double application of A3 dagger and a double application of A4 dagger, meaning we create two photons in mode 3 and we create two motons, photons in mode 4. So this is our output state. And here we can see that why we can only get detections in D3 or detections in D4. Because after the application of the B splitter, when the two photons arrive at the same time, the amplitudes for, uh, the, where, for the possibility where both of the photons are reflected or both of them are transmitted cancel. We, we don't have any term in here that would contain one photon in mode 3 and one photon in mode 4. Those possibilities cancel. They destructively interfere. And this is the output. We always get two photons in mode 3 or we get two photons in mode 4. So going back to our four possibilities, now we see that these two never occur for a 50-50 lossless beam splitter where the photons arrive at the same time due to destructive interference. On the other hand, these two possibilities do occur as we saw from the previous slide where we computed the state of the output fields. Now, why is this important? Hongu, Hongu Mandel effect can be used to test single photon sources. If you don't have a single photon in one of your inputs, then you will be able to detect coincidence counts. So it's a way of testing that your sources really do produce single photons. It's also important in quantum computation using linear optics, where Hongu Mandel effect is used to implement two qubit gates. And in networking, it's a principal component of uh, uh, applying a Bell state measurement using linear optics. But how, do we, how can we observe Hongu Mandel effect experimentally? So normally the type of signatures that we are looking for are, we start with indistinguishable photon wave packets. Those are allowed to interfere, which re, uh, uh, results in lowered coincidence counts. So what we can do is we can introduce a delay between the arrival of the photons at the beam splitter. And in that case, we should see some coincidence counts. On the other hand, if there is no delay and they arrive at the same time at the beam splitter, then we should see a drop in the coincidence rates. So this is a typical experimental signature of the Hongu Mandel effect. On the x-axis, we're plotting the delay between the arrival of the two photons. And on the y-axis, we are plotting the coincidence counts. And if the delay between them is large, then we can register some average number of coincidence counts. In this case, the two wave packets corresponding to mode 1 and mode 2 are distinguishable and there is no interference taking place, meaning coincidences can happen. But on the other hand, if the delay gets smaller and smaller, the wave packets begin to overlap and destructive interference starts to take place, meaning that uh, we uh, register a lowered coincidence counts, as we can see here. And when the delay is zero, meaning the photons arrive at the same time, the coincidence count is at some minimum. Ideally, it would be zero, but things are not perfect in the real world, so we'll register some uh, minimum. And then again, if we increase the delay, then coincidence counts increases back to its average. And this concludes our discussion of the Hongu Mandel effect.